In early 2022, a small correction was made to the Subnautica wiki that mentioned a small area underneath the lava zone. There is an unidentified area below the inactive lava zone accessed by a small hole or drop-off. It extends from 1300 to 1600 meters in depth, and small holes and drop-offs extending down to about 1700 meters. It looks like a completely barren version of the safe shallows with no flora or fauna. This update quickly caught traction amongst a very small group of Subnautica players on the subreddit, and they began to look for this entrance to a brave new zone. Sadly though, no one was able to find anything that actually led to a new area, but some players discovered that when looking at the interactive map more closely, there seemed to be two holes in the inactive lava zone that led to something other than the lava lakes. In fact, some players were able to even glitch through some of the game's terrain around these two conspicuous holes and discovered what looked like many unused assets and sounds potentially for a large biome that was cut from the game at some point. We already know from developer interviews and discussions that there was a lot of cut content in the lava zones, including lava sinkholes, lava bridges, and collapsing spires. So could it be that there was a long lost forgotten zone even deeper in the inactive lava zone that's hiding more secrets to this game. The origins of the precursors in Subnautica still remain largely a mystery to this day. It's assumed by many that the beings are nothing more than a long-lost civilization that used to rule the stars. After all, the word precursor itself means a person or thing that comes before another of the same kind. But wait, that's just it. If the precursors are the predecessors of something similar, then what is that similar thing? Well, based on everything we've seen in Subnautica this far, that something is most likely humans. After all, in-game we know from visions that precursors have similar colored vision to us, and on top of this, there are many ancient human weapons and artifacts and art we see inside of their structures. In fact, based on the small amount of precursor language we do see in-game, it seems to actually be heavily influenced by ancient Hindu text. The fact that our PDA can translate some of their words with what seems to be no struggle at all also further backs up this idea even more. But if precursors actually are some sort of human beings, then how did they even get here? Well, this is where the theory gets really wild. What if planet 4546b is actually Earth itself, long after the nuclear winter that likely occurred as we discussed earlier on this list. Most of humanity would have left the planet in search of other star systems, and these humans would have become the ones we know and love today in Subnautica, being led by massive transgov organizations like Altera and the Mongolian independent states. What about the humans that stayed on Earth though, and the ones that weren't lucky enough to leave? Could these be the actual original humans from Earth, the precursors for humanity as we know it today? Potentially these humans could have evolved down a different path and become the precursors themselves, but that begs the question, how would humans on a post-apocalyptic Earth become so much more advanced than humans that were able to get away? Well, maybe it's because the precursors are actually those same Earth humans from the future. That would also explain how planet 4546b could be Earth, as over countless years another moon could have come into contact with the planet's orbit, and that could have caused sea levels to rise dramatically. Hence why the world of Subnautica is almost entirely covered in water. Potentially the precursors are nothing more than the original human race, far into the future, and they are trying to travel back in time to the original outbreak of the Kara to stop it. And as part of that mission, they are trying to send signals back to the other sect of humanity that originally left Earth in order to help stop the end of the universe as we know it. Maybe by taking the Altera PDA with us through the portal to the precursors at the end of Subnautica Below Zero, we are actually giving old humanity a way to find the more advanced new breed. If we take this all into account, that would mean that Subnautica is actually an intense and deep science fiction epic about a hyper-futuristic humanity that must travel back in time to alert another sect of humanity that has evolved in their own way about the biggest danger the galaxy has ever seen in an attempt to lead the human race to salvation. Or it's a game about cute little underwater fish. Don't ruin this for me. The Karar bacterium is the biggest threat we face in all of Subnautica. No questions asked. But what if this seemingly deadly virus was actually the hero of the entire story and was our true salvation all along? You see, in ancient Greece, Kara was actually a popular girl's name and also signified purity and righteousness. And on top of this, in ancient Puranic cultures, which went on to heavily influence modern Hindu culture, which is used a lot in Subnautica in different texts, 
there was a famous story of a young woman named Kara who was a fierce fighter. Kara was betrayed by her friends and family who were hell-bent on setting the world on a path to burn and crumble. And in order to retaliate and save the purity of the world, she donned her bow and set forth against them, vanquishing them all along with an army of powerful giants. Could it be that the Kara bacterium in Subnautica is a reference to this? Because if it is, that would heavily imply that the Kara virus is actually a force for good against a world that is hell-bent on destroying itself. We already know too that Subnautica has lots of different themes of ecological disaster and the importance of caring for the environment. So what if the reason for this is because humanity far into the future, via the help of trans governments, is slowly bleeding the universe of its resources and killing it? Could it be that the Kara is actually a natural reaction from nature to fight back against these aggressors? Maybe the Kara and the trillions of lives it will take are actually the only way to save the galaxy in the long term. It's certainly a theme we've seen in a lot of other sci-fi as of late. Probably one of the coolest vehicles in all of Subnautica, the Cyclops is known for being massive and a power hog, but also a captain's fantasy come to life. One of the lesser known and best features of the hulking brute though, is how the Cyclops tends to greet the player whenever they enter. There are a variety of lines ranging from serious to comical, but regardless, it never gets old being welcomed by a friendly voice after a long adventure deep underwater. Welcome aboard, Captain. Old systems online. But could this voice actually be hiding an insane secret? You see, some players noticed that there was a rare voice line that would sometimes play when entering the vehicle, where the captain's voice would announce, You are the best captain on the planet. I'm not even squidding. You are the best captain on the planet. I'm not even squidding. This quip seems funny at first, but it makes us begin to wonder how the AI on board was able to make such a good dad joke. Could it be possible that this seemingly harmless AI on board, the Cyclops, is actually starting to gain sentience? There's more validity to this theory too, as almost anything in Subnautica that revolves around computers handled by Altera, a transgovernmental organization that funded the Aurora's mission to construct a phase gate in the Ariadne arm portion of the galaxy that houses planet 4546b, have strange happenings around them. For example, on some of the PDA entries on different fauna in the game, some plants are described as annoying or pests. That sounds less like a computer and more like a human being with consciousness. Some in the community have even begun to speculate that on top of the research facilities for the Kara virus on planet 4546b, there could potentially also be some successful AI research going on as well, as we already know the planet was home to some of the best and brightest precursors in the universe. If you ask almost any Subnautica player what the scariest zone is, almost everyone would say the void. It's a giant, never-ending chasm of utter darkness and terror that can be found by traveling to the edges of the map in-game. It's also here we can find massive ghost leviathans that will hunt down and decimate anything they find over 8,000 meters below the sea. And while these creatures are terrifying, there may actually be even more demented monsters deeper in these waters, the gargantuan super leviathans. They are a rumored apex predator that is said to dwarf any and everything we have seen in the game so far and also may hold some secrets to the ancient history of this planet. Located in the bone fields of the Lost River in the first game is a Colossus-class creature of which only the bones remain. The specimen is so large that even just its head is bigger than the sea truck itself, and when measuring the full skeleton accounting for the fact that so much of it is hidden from the sand, the entire leviathan would measure around 1100 to 1300 meters long, almost a mile. This puts this monster well above the size of anything we have seen in any of the games, and shows that there's a lot more hiding deep underwater than we thought. In fact, one of the craziest revelations of this find is that a creature of this size would most certainly not be able to swim in the somewhat shallow waters of the Lost River, implying that at some point this area of the map must have been a completely different depth and biome. This creature, just on its own, is over half the length of the entire map in Subnautica itself, so an area that it could actually call home must have been unlike anything we've encountered thus far. On top of this, if we date the bones we find in game, they can be traced back to well over 3 million years ago, meaning this gargantuan super leviathan has been a native to this planet for an unimaginable amount of time. In terms of what these creatures would have been like, and even what the planet was like so many years ago, it's hard to say. 
But judging from the fact that we can find very similar skeletons multiple times in the Lost River Zone, but smaller, it implies there must have been multiple of these species, meaning larger creatures were more common at the time. But this begs the question, do these massive and horrific super leviathans still exist somewhere on planet 4546b? And if they do, could they be hiding in the most mysterious zone of all in Subnautica, deep within the void? Maybe in the next upcoming game, we can finally find out. As many Subnautica veterans already know, that giant ship in the distance at the start of the first game is the crashed Aurora ship, of which the player character was originally on board before being shot down. The Aurora was initially coming into contact with the planet in order to build a phase gate for faster than light travel to the system, but also there was a top secret secondary mission in order to figure out what had happened to a previously downed ship called the Degassi, a Mongolian vessel Altera had interest in. But upon finding the planet, the Aurora was shot down and only 25 of the 50 escape pods on the port side were able to be fired before the crash landing. In the actual game, however, only 10 of these pods, including the one we start in as the player, can be found. So this naturally starts to make us wonder, what happened to the other 15 life pods that did in fact successfully deploy from the Aurora? One possibility is that they simply were damaged beyond recognition during the crash landing. Because while they did successfully deploy per the Aurora computer logs, that doesn't mean the massive amount of debris flying in the air after the cannon shot wouldn't have proved fatal for most life pods. The fact that our pod is still in such good condition, for example, is a miracle in and of itself. Another idea is that some of the pods may have crash landed on some of the actual terrain of the planet above water and have been decimated by the impact. This certainly could have been the case because while most of the planet is underwater, there are also large pockets of landmass, as we see in the sequel Below Zero. But one of the most haunting and probably most likely theories is that these remaining 15 life pods actually landed in the hellish void zone. If this were the case, the inhabitants would have been subject to a slow and painful descent, tens of thousands of meters underwater, where some would have been swallowed whole by ghost leviathans on their travel downward, and the unlucky few who made it to the bottom would have been met with the most unbelievable and crazy creatures and fauna in the entire universe, likely doing everything they could to survive before meeting their end, or simply dying instantly due to the high amounts of pressure at those depths. The last theory, and potentially worst of all, is the idea that the life pods were never meant to actually save anyone in the first place. This postulation comes from the fact that our own life pod and all of the others we find in game are very, very sparse on resources. Anyone that was in fact trapped in these in space or planet side would need to find other shelter and resources pretty much immediately or meet their certain doom. We already know that Altera is a very evil corporation in the game in many ways, so it begs the question. Could Altera purposely have not put survival equipment in each pod in order to save on cost? After all, it would be much cheaper to just compensate the families for their loss than to fund an entire new expedition through multiple phase gates for rescue, especially in a location where ships are known to go missing. At the end of the day though, we still don't know what happened to the missing Aurora life pods, and if anything, I'm hoping the next installment in the series will finally shed some light on this big mystery. Located deep inside the main aquarium of the disease research facility on planet 4546b, you may have stumbled upon the skeletal remains of an unknown creature. Based on the logs in the facility, we know this fossil is over a thousand years old and was marked during testing as codenamed Research Specimen Theta. On first glance, the remains of this majestic beast seem to somewhat resemble biters and sand sharks, as all these animals have the same similar eye structure, with two main eyes in the front of the skull followed by a second set just behind them. And it seems this assumption is correct because in the logs we can find in the game, it confirms this. But for research specimen Theta, the second pair of eyes is much smaller, and because of this, their actual purpose is unknown. Based on all this though, it can be inferred that the biters, sand sharks, and bone sharks that we see today in the world all likely stem from this ancient and mysterious research specimen Theta. Diving deeper into the logs, we can see that this creature also mostly fed on plant life, and likely lived in environments more flush with fauna, which has since largely died out, presumably due to the Cara bacterium outbreak, even though sometimes in the logs we do see that the Cara isn't affecting the fauna. 
And on top of this, the specimen's large size once again implies that previously on the planet, there were much larger animal and plant life that covered the seas, with entirely different biomes we haven't seen. As to what actually happened to this fossil though, it's hard to say. It's likely that the creature died when the facility went into lockdown and testing was abandoned, leaving him to starve alone in his cage without any friends or family in sight. It's a harrowing thought for sure and shows just how dark the Subnautica universe and lore can really be. While most of the Subnautica main story centers around the crashed Aurora ship, the downed Mongolian cruiser, the Degassi, might be even more interesting. Of its original six crew members, only three survived the crash, Paul Torgal and his son Bart Torgal, as well as the woman of the hour, Margaret Maida, a mercenary protecting the ship. They were able to slowly build up a base of operations on a nearby island as well as underwater, but soon realized they had become infected with the Kara bacterium on the planet and didn't have long to live. In order to help their odds of survival, Margaret tracked a Reaper Leviathan back to their base so Paul could study it for findings on the Kara. But sadly, another Reaper Leviathan had followed Margaret and ended up leveling the base. In an attempt to save Paul and Bart, Margaret fought the Reaper Leviathan in her prawn suit as it carried her deep into the void, never again to be seen. That is until Subnautica Below Zero released, where we do actually meet Margaret Maida on Delta Island. It's here we learn that the Leviathan carried Margaret for miles on end through the void, and she only managed to narrowly kill the monster and then swim to the surface. She used the corpse of the monster to make shelter in the middle of the ocean and survived for three weeks until she hit landfall in Sector Zero, otherwise known as Below Zero. This is why later in Below Zero we also are able to find her and speak to her. The real mystery though comes from just what exactly Margaret saw in the void, and more importantly, how she survived with the Kara bacterium now for over a decade. Some theories postulate that Margaret simply is stronger than most people, or has a natural immunity, but for me, that just doesn't make enough sense. After all, most people are dying within a week. Ten years seems excessive. A more likely scenario is that a peeper that had crossed a precursor vent had some of the Enzyme 42 serum on it that helped Margaret survive longer. But in this form, it would not have been a cure, just an aid for some time. So it still begs the question, how is Margaret still alive and kicking almost a decade later? Well, here comes the really interesting lore. Because in Subnautica Below Zero, the zone that a good portion of the map takes place on did not have any Enzyme 42 treatment taking place for over a thousand years. Meaning any and everything should be dead and long gone. But when we arrive, that's most certainly not the case. For example, we can find a fossilized but still alive leviathan that is heavily infected but not dead even after thousands of years. The only issue with this though is if there is something in Sector Zero that is causing a cure for the Kara, why didn't more precursors settle here and why is there no talk of a cure in the logs? The final and potentially best theory is that consuming the Reaper Leviathan's flesh saved Margaret. You see, the only animals in Subnautica that do not show signs of the Kara are a very small handful of the Leviathans, implying that some of them have somehow grown in immunity. Maybe by consuming an entire Reaper Leviathan to stay alive, Margaret also accidentally cured herself of the Kara. My personal issue with this theory though, is if this were the case, how is this not discovered by anyone else by this point? Sure, the Leviathans could be hard to study due to their aggression and size, as we've already seen, but surely by this point someone would have discovered this. For me, the best explanation is that something happened while Margaret was being carried around by the Reaper Leviathan in the void, and she came into contact with a mysterious and powerful something that cured her, something that might be explored even deeper in the void in a future game. One of the most valuable resources in all of Subnautica is the scraps of metal we find everywhere on the ocean floor. These scraps include schematics and upgrades to our ships and homes that allow us to build more advanced machinery that helps us reach the deepest points of the map. The crazy thing about all this metal though is just how much of it there is. Almost everywhere you go on the map, if you are searching for it, you will find lots of metal and even other materials that obviously do not stem from the planet itself and it makes it abundantly clear that lots of people have been here before. The question though is, just how many people is that? It's widely been assumed that most of this material stems from the Crast or Aurora ship, and this is also why it's quite recognizable. But could it be that lots of this material is actually from other crashed ships over the last couple of thousand years? After all, the only ships we know that went down are the Degassi and Aurora, but there is no evidence to say that there couldn't have been many more, like say the Mercury 2. 
One idea I have that I think would be really awesome is that Altera Corporation could have been secretly sending dozens of other ships to the planet on top secret missions that no one knows about, and all have been shot down. So they keep on sending more and more people to the system, telling them they are the first ones going there, when really they are just another sacrifice for Altera to do more research on what's going on. Based on the ending of Subnautica Below Zero, where we get to go to a precursor planet, if this theory is correct, we could find other humans there from other downed ships as well. Perhaps the most recognizable creature from the entire series, the Peepers, are those cute little fishes we see in the starting zones of the Subnautica games, near coral reefs. They're a welcome addition to a world that is filled to the brim with creepy and disturbing monsters, and serve as a playful escape from the horrors we find in deeper waters. But these happy-go-lucky fish may actually be hiding a secret. You see, as any Subnautica veterans know, as you start to venture into deeper and less explored zones, you begin to encounter leviathans, or massive underwater monsters that will attack and slaughter you at a moment's notice. Shortly after the initial release of Subnautica, however, rumors started to swirl that some players were encountering a different kind of leviathan deep in the lava zone, none other than a massive and aggressive peeper? Many in the community have since tried to hunt down this ancient beast, but to no avail, and even after searching the game files, there's no such reference to the monster. So it looks like the Peeper Leviathan is nothing more than a myth and April Fool's joke, but there are some signs pointing to the idea that it may actually not be so far-fetched. Like some very old and early Subnautica concept art that seems to depict Peeper-like creatures with a much more massive scope. Could it be one of our greatest sources of food in the games is actually hiding a massive secret, one that would see us becoming the food instead? Potentially there was an idea to put it into the game at some point, but it was cut out. After all, the peepers in the series do play a huge role. Either way though, to this day, many are still out in the deepest waters of Subnautica searching for the great peeper leviathans. And in fact, there's even a host of mods available online today to the community that can make this dream come true. One of the most vital fish in Subnautica throughout each player's playthrough will be the renowned bladderfish. It's an eerie yet somehow cute looking little guy that is often used for crafting resources like water bottles that can be used to stop us from dying from thirst. Ironic for a game based underwater. What a lot of players don't know though, is the horrifying and disturbing backstory behind how these guys were first made. You see, in Japan there's a term called omarashi or omo, that signifies a form of fetishization, where participants wear a full adult diaper and find pleasure in emptying themselves of all demons. One of the main Subnautica art team developers had actually originated from one of these massive bladder cults based in Wyoming, and this is where the idea for the creature originally stems from. The color of the fish actually represents one of the developer's fondest memories of a horrendous night where... <laughs> I'm just messing with you guys. One of the key ingredients of Subnautica's amazing gameplay loop is the sense of thalassophobia it gives the player, or in other words, an intense fear of large bodies of water. It feels like everywhere we go in the game, there are massive monsters, creepy sounds, or just an eerie, never-ending abyss to get lost in. What a lot of players don't know, though, is that potentially the most scary biome of all was actually cut from the game. You see, if we take a look at some of the earliest and least well-known Subnautica concept art revealed by the team years later, there's one small slide that mentions a single cell landscape with a couple of notes. This unique biome would have, as the name suggests, consisted of just a single celled organism of massive proportions, lurking in the dark and taking over an entire zone. Players in their ship would have to move around in complete darkness while the tentacles from the alien slowly tried to grab onto the ship and pull us into its essence. The music would have consisted of haunting violin screeches and the low and ominous scream of trombones as the player leisurely descended into madness. It's certainly one of the creepiest zones we have heard about in all of Subnautica, but also one I really wish was in the game, as the atmosphere sounds unmatched. As to whether or not this zone will ever actually appear in the games, it remains to be seen, but it's yet another great idea for the eventual sequel we could see. Potentially one of the most tragic but less well-known stories in all of Subnautica is that of the Soul Trans Gov ship, the Mercury 2. For those that don't know, Sol is one of the three colossal transgov organizations we know about in Subnautica that hold extensive and massive swaths of space under their regime, with the other two being Altera and the Mongolian independent states. 
The Solons, though, are a lot different than the other two trans governments, as they are characterized by their willingness to free themselves from the worldly desires of endless growth and productivity, and instead are pursuing what would make humanity best at all costs. This is exactly what the Mercury 2's mission was, and why it was in the Ariadne Arms section of the galaxy. The ship was originally rendezvousing with a Mongolian mining interest on a separate planet and convinced them to implement a more harsh mining quota. So essentially, the crew of the Mercury 2 was an army of monk socialists who voted for Bernie, and one of their crew members was also an extremely talented and curious engineer named Elliot. When attempting to leave the system, the ship scanned planet 4546b and discovered ancient alien signatures, unbeknownst to the crew being the precursors, and Elliot was able to convince the captain of the ship, Diana, to stop and take a look at the chance they may find huge riches. But as the ship entered the zone of 4546B, the quarantine enforcement platform cannon shot at them immediately. But miraculously, the crew was able to dodge the original shot from the cannon by deploying all flares at once and also dumping their molten hot water contained in the nuclear reactor core of the engine. This large heat signature confused the quarantine enforcement platform and also showed that the precursor weapons work on heat signatures similar to human technology. Sadly though, the ship on landing needed to refuel and some of the engines were still damaged. So while the crew started to work on repairing the ship, Elliot was sent out to explore and eventually came across an alien SOS signal, which probably is the same signal the player finds from the alien architect Allen in Subnautica Below Zero. Soon after this though, multiple crew of the Mercury 2 were slaughtered by some of the sharks in the area. And even more horrifying, a portion of the crew had begun to contract Kara and were dying and spreading it to others. In a last ditch effort to save the remaining crew, the ship captain Diana initiated an all hands on deck evacuation, skipping engine check procedures and abandoning all crew infected with Kara with only two weeks of supplies. As expected though, as soon as the ship was in the air, the quarantine enforcement platform once again fired, but this time with a direct hit which sent the ship flying into the ocean where we can find it in-game today, 30 to 100 years later. The last recording we have of the incident was actually a log Diana made of their final moments. I heard the sound of metal tearing and for a split second, everything was tinged bright green and unbearably hot. Then I saw daylight and I was looking down at the ocean and ice. The strongest wind I've ever felt roared in my ears ripping through the ship people went flying out the side of the mercury so much screaming and chaos i was lucky i had just clipped into my sea tinker stephanos came out of nowhere like a malaika an angel i felt his rough calloused hand grasp mine with the gentlest of urgency it felt like time slowed he said i gotcha just follow me ella i don't know how but he used an emergency tether to drag me to the nuclear reactor core, the strongest bulkhead in the ship. We hit the water and everything went black. <sighs> He's sleeping. I think he might have hit his head. I'm exhausted. The adrenaline has long since worn off and my body aches. I think I might have fractured the rib. I'm gonna shut my eyes for a bit. When I wake up, I'll figure this out. Where this theory gets really interesting, though, is the name of the actual ship. You see, in Roman mythology, Mercury, or Latin Mercurius, is the god of merchants, but also the god of thieves and tricksters. Could it be that the Mercury 2 always had a mission to explore planet 4546b? After all, their original mission seems like almost a waste of resources they used to get through so many phase gates from the Andromeda galaxy they hail from. This would imply that all major transgov organizations in-game have an interest in the precursor technology, and also would imply that a lot more people have an idea of what's going on on 4546b than meets the eye. Maybe some large and powerful shadow governments and entities have a massive interest and stake in the planet that we don't know about, and the conspiracy of the precursors and their involvement with the Kara goes so much deeper than we could ever imagine. I certainly hope so as it could be a great addition to a new game. One of the aspects about Subnautica that makes it so scary isn't just the leviathans and dark crevices they hide in, but rather the fact that we have so little to actually fight back against them with. As to why this is, it actually all comes down to an in-game event called the Massacre at Obraxis Prime. 
weapons were removed from standard survival blueprints following the massacre on Abraxas Prime. The knife remains the only exception. The issue with this event, though, is we don't actually know what occurred here. If we take Altera's word for it, it would seem that there was some sort of uprising against a small Altera facility on an unknown planet called Abraxas Prime. But as to the motives of the uprising and what actually happened, we only have wild speculation to go off of. Altera would have had to send in military personnel to quell the uprising citizens, but because they were equipped with weapons in their life pods, they were able to fight back and it resulted in countless bloody deaths. Another potential and insane theory is that the massacre at Obraxis Prime is all made up. We already know that Altera is an extremely corrupt and lying entity, so it could be that the entire massacre and deaths are all made up in order to make sure none of the Altera research facility have access to weapons, and the off chance they ever do actually try to uprise and rebel. But as to the real reason why we have no weapons in the game, the answer actually stems from an event in our real life. You see, during the Sandy Hook shooting back in December of 2012, Unknown Worlds was on the verge of releasing Natural Selection 2, which was host to a lot of guns and shooting. But because of how saddened lots of the team members were from the Sandy Hook event, they actually decided that their next game was not going to include any weapons at all. And this is the actual and real reason for the lack of underwater firepower in Subnautica. Subnautica's Lost River is host to some of the most ancient and interesting finds in the entire game series, and our long lost forgotten Leviathan class organism is no different. Because right outside the laboratory cache lies a massive and million year old fossil belonging to a species we have never seen in game before. The monstrosity sits at just over the length of a sea truck and is sporting a massive set of teeth and spikes on its head, along with three similarly shaped eye sockets on each side of its skull. It almost is reminiscent of research specimen Theta in a lot of ways, and actually might even be an organism of the same species, but much older. While at first glance the fossil seems to be just the head of the beast, upon further inspection it becomes clear that the fossil is in fact the entire body, with just a little bit hidden under the sand. The most interesting part about this creature though is the implications of its body on its movement. The body is sporting no fins or ways of movement we often see in other aquatic animals, and this is usually an indication that the animal actually moves on the ocean floors. So is it possible that we are looking at a giant carnivorous sea slug that combs the depths of the sea on this planet? An even bigger question arises when we realize that this is the only instance of this type of skull we see in the entire series, where most others we find have multiple renditions. Could this mean that this apex predator actually lives beneath the sand and inside rocks and burrows around the environment stalking its prey? We know there were similar sorts of animals that were cut from the game originally, but at one point were planned to pop out of different rocks and surfaces to scare the player. It certainly would make sense based on the shape of this creature, and if it were true, it would prove that we have only scratched the surface of what we can find in Subnautica on our adventures so far. While we have all grown to love the home planet of Subnautica's 4546B, with all its weird creatures and underground caves, a lot of players in the community are still wondering what Earth in Subnautica is actually like. We know Subnautica takes place far into the future with faster than light travel, multiple new alien species discovered, and massive organizations that span multiple star systems. But in all of this, there's basically no mention of Earth in any of the game's lore, and considering we play as humans, you would think our natural birthplace in the stars would play a bigger role. Well, the reason for its absence may be more sad than you thought. If we take a look at the radiation suit description in-game, at the very end of the logs there's a tag phrase, a necessary precaution in a post-MAD world. For those that don't know, MAD is actually an acronym for Mutually Assured Destruction, and was a big talking point during the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, when fears of nuclear winter and the end of Earth as we know it were high. Considering we find this phrase on the radiation suit specifically, it seems quite likely that Earth and Subnautica actually fell during an all-out nuclear war. On top of this, in the Cuttlefish PDA entry in-game, at one point it is noted that, as observed in Earth's dolphins, before their extinction. This once again lends credence to the idea that Earth has been obliterated, but the most damning evidence of all actually comes from an Altera PDA entry we find in-game as well. During the expansion, Altera supplied arms to all sides acquiring and housing a vast colonist workforce, and making the transition from manufacturer to corporate state. 
Altera's threat to cease trade was one of the turning points in the conflict bringing about the end of hostilities and signing of the Charter. Based on this evidence, it seems clear that the fate of Earth and Subnautica is less than stellar. In fact, I try to find more evidence of this based on the natural selection lore as well, considering they take place in the same universe, but I wasn't able to find anything. So if any of you guys know anything about that universe, feel free to comment down below. Have you ever felt like you were being watched while playing Subnautica? It's a common fear many in the community have all become accustomed to. After all, the deeper you travel into the depths of the sea, the more sense of horror grows. Leviathans lurk behind every corner, and if you listen closely, you can sometimes hear the faint sounds of what seemingly is scared screaming. But what if their real concern wasn't a monster we already know exists, but rather one that's been lurking in the shadows the entire time? Something more terrifying than a leviathan could ever be. You see, throughout the game, the player receives many distress signals and messages from other life pods scattered throughout the planet. But strangely, every single time we actually arrive at their location they pinged for SOS, everyone is missing or dead already. If we go back and read the messages after discovering that no one else is alive, suddenly a chilling realization starts to set in. Nine new biological subjects designated. Mode switch, hunting, analyzing. Sharing subject location with other agents. Subject 11783 destroyed. Switch mode patrol. New targets unaccounted for. 1. These haunting SOS signals now become much more creepy when we have the context that the crews we originally thought were sending them were likely dead the whole time. Because you see, when first receiving these signals, it seems as if other life pod workers were scanning and found us, asking us to come help. But with the context that literally everyone is missing, could it actually be that something much more unbelievable and sinister is going on? What if these messages weren't actually from your other crewmates, but instead from some unknown and mysterious entity residing on planet 4546b? This would perfectly explain the one unaccounted for target mentioned in multiple distress signals. That target could either be you, being watched and analyzed on the planet, or your other crew members discovering that hidden entities in the shadows were watching them. Potentially this could be Alan from Below Zero searching for help on his precursor voyage, but I don't think so, because if we reread the messages again, we can see that specifically there's some sort of watching going on, as we can see them switch modes between patrol and hunting, analyzing. To me this sounds more like someone else, or something else, is on this planet with us, and well aware of our presence. Could this mysterious entity be the one sending fake SOS signals from life pods to lure us over to them for further study? And if so, what's the reason behind all of this? Could the things watching us be the precursors? Previously downed human shipmates that are worried about contracting Kara from us? Or a new alien or mechanical species we aren't yet aware of? Certainly there is something or someone watching us as we swim and travel around the world of Subnautica, and this realization only adds to the immense fear that this game can produce, and shows that after all the scary monsters and sounds that Subnautica has left us with, the most horrifying thing of all was something hiding in the shadows the entire time, and only briefly alluded to in the game's lore and logs.